you imagine uh, standing in the temple during that afternoon time of sacrifice on the day our Savior was crucified. We just sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We sing, of course, I will enter into his gate and into his courts. Can you imagine standing there as the priest would have done that afternoon that our Savior was crucified and there at the altar of incense, it was the altar where the aromas of the incense would fill the holy place. And it's there, uh, just beyond the, uh, the altar of incense, would have been the veil. Can you imagine the priest having doing his duty in the temple and there in the holy place, uh, where the veil, which have so shockingly and surprisingly, without any help, just rent in twain, as the Bible says. And for the first time, as a priest doing his duty, he was not allowed to see into the Holy of Holies, the place where the ark would have been. It was not his responsibility nor his privilege uh, to see into or enter into or touch anything there in that place. Can you imagine the shock as the veil rent in twain and for the first time seeing into that place, seeing the ark of the covenant? Matter of fact, um, he probably would have feared for his life. Life would have been required at such an event. But as just as we sang, we, we sang the song, I will enter into his gates and into his courts. It's a peppy little chorus that we like to sing. We sang it some this morning. And boy, we, we think about entering into his gates. By the way, I hope you're inside the gates already. I hope you're already there in your heart and in your mind. And hopefully you're in the courts already. And prayerfully now as we open the Bible... Uh, by the way, that's why we're gathered together, is it not? It's for the Word of God. And as we open the Bible, we kind of step into that holy of holies where God himself resides, where God himself is contained, if you want to call it that. And we open the Bible, I hope your heart is truly in tune uh, with what the Lord would have for you. Well, I see several visitors this morning, and we hope you enjoy your time with us as we enter into the gates and the courts of the Lord. As we open the Bible now and begin to talk about, teach and preach that the truths that we so desperately need for our daily living. We, we've been the, dealing with the armor of the believer. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. I invite your attention there to those verses that I'm sure you're pretty familiar with. Ephesians chapter 6. There have been a lot of messages and lessons brought concerning the armor of the believer. And so my intention is not to uh, unveil some new incredible truth. My intention is to remind us and to encourage us and to challenge us in terms of the battle. And what verse 12 suggests is a wrestling match, the toe-to-toe, -toe, hand hand-to-hand combat that we have in terms of a spiritual world. By the way, again, I don't know whether you know it or not, but there are probably demons in our presence. Amen. That's not to be creepy, that's not to be, you know, you know, whatever, mysterious, anything like that. The Bible tells us that we wrestle against, uh, rather not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And specifically then he goes on a little further and says it's the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then again it's, it's, it's uh, uh, the, 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 uh, those that work in the highest places, spiritual wickedness in high places. We're definitely dealing with a spiritual enemy. And God clearly wants us to win in our daily life and certainly serve him well in terms of the battlefield that's going on. Well, let me give you one quick plug here for tonight, for our Sunday evenings. If you do not attend our Sunday nights, I want to encourage you to come. I have just felt led of the Lord to bring some messages, not so much on the battle idea, what we're dealing with in the Sunday mornings, but I'm taking that phrase, principalities and powers, and we're bringing some messages that are really contained in the spiritual world. We're not talking so much about the battle uh, idea of it as much as giving some biblical uh, foundation for understanding it and knowing exactly what it is. And I don't know if, how familiar you are with the principalities and powers that God speaks of. And by the way, we're not, uh, not going to do any seances. All right, we're not going to conjure up any spirits, nothing like that. We want to take a good, honest look at this enemy of which we are engaged with, doing our best to understand uh, what we're facing 
and understand what God gives us in terms of his word and information about what's good for us as we battle against these forces, by the way, which are quite good. The enemy is quite good at what they do. Look around the world and see the havoc and chaos that Satan has created through the battle of which we're talking about. Look around and see the devastation that's come upon the earth and the creation because of sin that happened so long ago there in the Garden of Eden. And since that time, the havoc and chaos that he's just had his way with in the lives of believers. So, By the way, you and I are not exempt from the havoc and chaos that Satan can bring into our life as well. Now, if you're here this morning and you're saved, you've believed upon Christ as your Savior. You are not exempt from the havoc and chaos that Satan can bring into your life. The influence of himself and his army of demons can be very clear and very important and very debilitating in terms of your living. And so if you're here this morning and you're not doing very well in the battle, I want you to know something. You can be encouraged to know that your victory is found in Christ. We're going to find that here in our next piece of armor in that this idea of righteousness provides for you not just your salvation, but it provides the daily victory, the daily living for the Lord that is so crucial and so critical uh, for our needs of battle in our, in our time of need. By the way, Satan is the great deceiver, is he not? Don't think for a minute. Uh, again, as I've studied uh, some about this principalities and powers, his greatest tool is that of deceit. He is a mimicker. Matter of fact, tonight we're going to be talking about the invisible kingdom of principalities and powers, just as well as you and I as believers are a part of the kingdom of God. Satan also has a kingdom, a kingdom that is very real, yet unseen, yet invisible, and we're going to understand some of the structure that he has put into that and some of the, the, the things that have gone into that kingdom. And so we're not, uh, we are not exempt. And if you're not winning your battle today, I encourage you to, first of all, take on the whole armor of God by which you are able to survive the day, but put on the whole armor of God that we can enact a strategy of God against our enemy and against the kingdom of evil in the end that the honor and glory to God might be that people might be saved. Now that's a lot of talk. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of encouragement. Here's the deal. that This kingdom of, of evil of which we are engaged with, clearly they're, they're, the difference is simply this. We're talking about salvation. Salvation ushers you from one kingdom into the other. Colossians chapter 1 declares that, that through the faith in Christ you are being, have been delivered from the kingdom of evil and Satan into the kingdom of righteousness and the kingdom of God. By the way, what great kingdoms they are. What a beautiful time it is to realize that we are the subjects of one kingdom or another. You're either the subject of a kingdom of evil or you're the subject of a kingdom of righteousness. One or the other, you are the subjects of one. And thereby, we must engage ourselves. We're engaged whether we want to or not with the issues of evil. Amen. That's why God says in verse 10 there in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor. I mean, nobody's going to go to battle without some armor on. And so the encouragement is, is that we engage, that we would put on this armor. Now, last week we looked at, took, uh, took a look at the first piece of armor. That is uh, the, 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 the uh, loins girt about with truth or the belt of truth. And by the way, there's one thing that holds us all together, just like your belt holding up your trousers, gentlemen. Amen. There's one thing that holds us all together, and that's truth. Amen. By the way, are you feeling me this morning? I, I've got my foot on the gas pedal and I feel like I'm dragging you along. Are you okay this morning? The issues of truth not just hold us together, it's incredibly important that we understand that God equated truth with our loins and in the loins, of course, is the idea of the, the reproduction or procreativity, the next generation. Don't think for a minute God hasn't given you the ability to win somebody to Christ. And the birth of an unbeliever into the kingdom of God, it comes through your loins, if you will, the seed of truth, the word of God that God uses to bring those from the kingdom of evil into the kingdom of God. Amen. It's all about truth. Truth not only holds us together, it's also that point of attack. Satan is doing his best to ruin the issues of truth. 
He's doing his best to take truth and change it. He's doing his best to redefine truth. He's doing his best to convince us that there really is no truth. Many people today believe uh, that there is no absolute truth. Well, there's one thing we must agree on, and that is this, that the one absolute truth is that God in heaven is the only God. Because everything else comes from there. Everything else in terms of understanding and structure and righteousness and purity comes from a God in heaven that indeed is right and true. And our belief in a God of heaven of truth certainly translates into all other truth in life. Can we agree and, sum, and submit to you that if there are those who would say, and if, and if it be true, that there is no absolute truth, then we might simply say this, there is no God. Is that right? Because if God is not true, then why is he a God? I mean, if God has it not true, then, then why are we worshiping such a beast? Why are we worshiping such a, a, an entity or a being? If God is not true, then there are no absolute truths, then in the end, we might submit that there is no God. I'm glad that there is a God. And I'm glad that there's a God of truth. And I'm glad that it's the truth of our God in which we worship that translates into the next generation of those who would come and know Christ as personal Lord and Savior. I love the idea uh, where the, the Hebrews chapter 12 says that, that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You understand how many people have gone into and given their life that you might sit in that seat this morning? You understand how many people have given their life and their faith and their energy and their toil and their family and even their physical life that we might have church this morning? Do you understand that that sacrifice began with Christ? But through the last two millennia for sure, there have been literally thousands of, if not millions of people that have translated into the idea that we can have church this morning. And I guess my question is this, what about the next generation past us? What about the next generation? All, all data, all information, all observation, all views of our current world begins to suggest that the next generation is in jeopardy. It seems as if truth is not there, then the next generation is in trouble because if there's no truth, then what then is the next generation built on? And you and I know, you and I know it is just incumbent upon us uh, to share God and to share the truth of Christ that the next generation might come, that they might claim salvation, not by church membership, not by financial giving, that not, not by family heredity, but through the truth that comes in that Christ is Savior and our faith is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take a look at the second piece of armor. The Bible says in verse 14 there, put on the breastplate of righteousness. I think it's interesting. Again, I'm sure you've heard it preached. How God is equated, again, the breastplate with that of righteousness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 there about salvation, where we often will, where the Romans road kind of culminates and kind of has its ending place, that, you know, thou wilt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with, if, the, if a man believeth in his heart, then he has the righteousness of God coming unto him. Man believeth unto, with the heart, believeth unto righteousness. Therefore, the breastplate, uh, the idea of protecting the most important piece of our life, if you will, that would be the heart of a man. God covers the most vulnerable, uh, the most important aspect of our being with the issues of righteousness in our spiritual walk. Now, that's important because if your heart is the place where righteousness is believed upon, then it becomes the righteousness of Christ that begins to protect you in the issues of battle. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, If our heart condemn us. Anybody's heart ever condemned them? Four of us. If our heart condemn us, the Bible's then verse 20 goes on and says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. 
for many of us, when it comes to righteousness, we think more about Isaiah 64 and 6. For all of our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. God says, I want you to begin to think a little bit differently. I want you to think a little more significantly. I want you to think a little more biblically and a little more spiritually. For as your, uh, your righteousness were as filthy rags, now, now your righteousness is found in Christ. Whereas your clothing, if you will, your identity, your covering was found in filthiness and sinfulness and wickedness. God says now, now your purity, your beauty, your gloriousness is found in the covering of the righteousness of Christ. Amen. For if our heart condemn us, our heart, by the way, it's John there in 1 John chapter 3. He's talking to believers. I mean, he's talking to those of us who claim Christ as Savior. Right, he, he's talking to those of us who, who spend time in church. And he says, now if your heart condemns you, there's one important factor about the heart. Whereas the heart believes unto God for righteousness, it's the same heart that's influenced by a wicked, evil kingdom. And Satan constantly, as your accuser says, you're a sinner. And you're a filthy, rotten sinner. Look what you did yesterday. And look what you did last week. And think about what you're going to do next week. Hadn't even happened yet. But think about what you're going to do next week. And your accuser and the great deceiver wants your heart to believe that the righteousness of God is not of use to you. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater. Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who could know it? But there is one that trieth the reins, that one being the Lord Jesus Christ. Who knows the heart of a man, save the God of heaven who formed and created the heart of a man. God knows your heart. God knows your situation. And God says now, when it comes to righteousness, put on the breastplate of righteousness because in the heart of man are the issues of belief. In the heart of man comes the issues of faith. In the heart of man comes the issues of submission to a king, either evil or righteous. And God said, put it on. Can I submit to you that your righteousness found in Christ as a breastplate? I thought about this this morning as a simple analogy. The breastplate becomes such a great protector. I mean, God didn't give you the breastplate, you know, for it to succumb to some evil army. By the way, Satan is not powerful enough to defeat the righteousness of Christ. I mean, again, let's remind ourselves, it's not as if the breastplate, you know, we're still worried about its performance. That's not the issue. The issue is that the righteousness of Christ is perfect unto us. But often we look at the breastplate as one, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to survive today or not. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to work through the issues of my day and work from victory because we found righteousness in Christ. And often as Satan comes against us, if he can deceive your heart to think other than what God is telling you to think, in the end you'll succumb to the temptations and the evil of the day. Does that make sense this morning? Verse 14, look there in Ephesians 6. It simply says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's understand, first of all, the point of attack. I'm going to go through a very similar outline that I did last Sunday. I'll probably continue this through the particular pieces of armor. But let's consider the particular point of attack, and that would be the issue of righteousness. Why is it that Satan, in all of his fury, comes against the believer and the armies of God, and God says, now let's don't be dece deceived about his strategy. We understand what Satan is trying to do. He is attacking the issues of righteousness in the world in which we live. God says, now let's understand the point of attack. Righteousness is defined as the purity of heart and rectitude of life. The conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Let me repeat that. Righteousness is, is defined as the purity of heart and rectitude of life. The conformity of heart and life to the the divine law. Can I get, submit one, one important uh, uh, piece of information to you? What we believe about righteousness must be found in the truth that comes from God and His Word. 
In other words, the, the, the purity of heart and the rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to divine law. If we don't believe in divine law, then our righteousness is all messed up. If we don't believe in the righteousness of God and the divine law of God, then the purity of our heart and the conformity of life is now suspect. God said this point of attack, Satan's strategy, is to attack this issue. There's really two aspects here. It's the idea of, of rectifying the problem in me. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23, For all have and come short of the glory of God. Let's make no mistake. I don't care who they are. I thought about the Terpstras this morning. Are they here this morning, the Terpstras? Okay. Little Ethan was born, what, a week or so ago. And uh, again, little Ethan, uh, he's a beautiful little boy. I'm going to tell you, with all love and respect, listen, little Ethan is a sinner. Is that right? He's a sinner. The Bible declares that all, I don't care where you've come from, doesn't matter what your race or color, doesn't matter your family, you know, the nobility of your family heredity, it doesn't matter your financial status. It doesn't matter what, what experiences you've had. God said, every person is a sinner. And because such, they have come up short. Listen to this. They've come up short of the gloriousness of the righteousness of God. In other words, there is no, as Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, there is none righteous. There is no one that has a rectitude of life. There's no one that has a purity of heart. The, the, the dilemma in the human life is that in order to rectify the problem, we have to go outside of ourselves and find a solution somewhere else. God said, your unbelief and your sin problem will send you to hell. There's only one answer, and that answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's real simple. The very issues of righteousness are that there's a purity problem. Again, Jeremiah again said that our heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who knows it? Well, God knows your heart. He knows the problem. But there's a second aspect of righteousness here that must be noted. Not just the, the rectifying the problem in life, but how about the conformity of life? It's the conformity of heart and life to divine law. By the way, first of all, let's make, let's make it clear here. We're talking now about a believer. Rectifying the problem in life, that's salvation. But now righteousness confronts the issues in the lives of believers, and that's conformity. Conforming ourselves to divine law. The Bible, again, tells us that our conformity is found in Jesus Christ. It's, it's God's eternal purpose that we would be transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The issue of conforming ourselves. So the two aspects of righteousness is rectifying the life of, of the problem of life and then conforming of our life into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now bring up that definition because it's important. The point of attack is simply this. Satan has attacked righteousness through deceit by causing many to believe that the source of of rectifying life's greatest problem is found within themselves. Satan has deceived the world because we truly begin to think, well, I'm not so bad. Things aren't so bad. I'm a good person. I've never murdered anybody. You know? Not with my hands anyway. Come on now, is that right? Satan has deceived us and, and, and caused the world to think that there's something within me that's good. And because there's something good within me, if I can lay hold of it, I can find the answers to my problems in life. There's something there that's good within me. Please understand, God said there's nothing good there. And Satan has attacked righteousness because he's beginning to redefine righteousness. In other words, you don't really have a problem. It's just a little thing. It's not a big thing. It's just a small situation. And God said, no, it's the problem of eternity. It's called being a sinner. And in the end, Satan is attacked. How about a second point of attack? Not just in deceit, but how about the issue of pride? Here's the issue of pride. Satan has attacked righteousness through pride by causing many to believe that they have 
within themselves the right to correct righteousness. It's not just that I can solve my own problems. The biggest problem is it's a wrong definition. In other words, that is not wrong. You with me? What God says is sin, I don't call sin. Therefore, if I can change and have the pride within me to think I can redefine divine law and divine righteousness, then guess what? My problem is solved because I'm okay with that. And often there are millions of people that I believe Satan has deceived the world through deceit and through pride to think that I can redefine it and therefore because I have power within myself, I can find solutions without any other help around me. And Satan, by the way, is that right or not? You're a tough crowd today. And the issue of Satan's attack, now here, here's the point, because God said, now you put on your breastplate because it's in the heart where belief is found where Satan will attack you. Satan will attack you as a believer. He will attack the issues of righteousness for you if you're not careful to not believe divine law and not believe divine truth. And then he'll deceive you to think that you don't have a problem. By the way, one of our greatest tools as a believer is that of confession. If we confess our sins. By the way, again, 1 John's talking to believers. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. By the way, one of the most difficult things for people to do is just confess. Well, I didn't really do that. It's their fault, his fault, her fault. It's because of this situation or that situation or this experience. Come on now, is that right or not? And the issue has become under attack. Satan has deceived us that if we can, even as believers, we can slowly begin to rewrite the book on righteousness because of our pride and because of being deceived. God, God says, now, put on the breastplate. Defend yourselves from the attack of an evil enemy. Defend yourselves with the issues of righteousness that's found in Christ. By the way, there's a great example. Remember the Apostle Paul there in Philippians chapter 3? Go, let's go look at it. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 4. Let's begin there. Paul, in talking about his own life. By the way, Paul was a Pharisee of the Judaistic religion. He was a Pharisee, but he was lost. He didn't know God. And he says in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the what? If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, what? L listen, did you capture that? As touching the law. As touching divine law, I'm a Pharisee. Nothing else said. Righteousness of God, Pharisees. Right? I mean, we, we're as good as it gets. Matter of fact, of all the Pharisees, listen, I'm the standard of Pharisees. I mean, I'm the one who understands. I can tell you about the law. I can teach it. I can quote it. I can give you reference after reference. I can do all that needs to be done. And in the end, the divine law and its standards of righteousness, I have met. Keep reading. Verse number 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. By the way, how's your zeal doing? You XY zealers, are you, are you zealous? People all the time, what is X, Y, Z? They're just old ABCs. <laughs> Woo, strike that from the tape right there, amen. I got to get you guys moving somehow, come on now. What is X, Y, Z? Extra years of zest. How's your zest doing? We're not talking about soap either. And he said, now zealous, Titus says zealous of good works. Paul said, you want to talk about zealousness? Guess what I do? I travel the roads looking for Christians. I put them in prison. 
and I kill them. Woo, praise God for me. That's a good standard of righteousness. That's what I'm supposed to do. How many of us could say that we're equal to Paul? Amen. Now the issues of Paul's righteousness, but look what he says now. By the way, keep reading there, verse 6. Persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. What's he say? By the way, Paul is lost. At this time, Paul was, he was lost. Touching the righteousness in the law. The righteousness of God. The standard for correctness in life and conformity to God. I have nothing by which anyone can lay at my feet as an accusation of failing. Blameless. By the way, how many lost people today are just like that? How many people today are just like that? Well, there's nothing you can, I'm, not, I'm doing good. I'm okay. But now notice Paul's assessment after salvation. But what things were gained to me, verse 7, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul, in terms of the attack of Satan, Paul was not deceived. Matter of fact, the righteousness of God through salvation had reshaped Paul's thinking. He realized now the deceit and the pride that he had before he was saved. The, the, the pride and the deceitfulness. I thought I was doing a good thing for God by putting Christians in prison. I thought I was doing a good thing by looking down my nose at others' failures and their issues of conformity. I thought I was doing a good thing by remembering and teaching and doing all these things, but without faith and without righteousness. And Satan has attacked. I would simply say this, ultimately... Satan's strategy, to, it's, to, it's to blind men to the truth found in God. It's simply to blind men. I found over in Ephesians there, chapter 4, I say I found it, I, I was reminded by the Lord, verse 17 through 19, it talks about through the ignorance that is in them, and it says specifically the blindness that is in their hearts. You think it's any coincidence that God gave us the breastplate to cover the heart? Because in the end, God knows the only power for defense, the only issue that will cause you to survive is the issue of righteousness found in the Lord. So let's talk point number two. Let's talk about the power of righteousness. The power of righteousness is simply this. It's in the issues of righteousness and specifically the righteousness of Christ where we find any kind of answers for the dilemma of our lives. It's only in Christ. The Bible says that righteousness then is equated with the breastplate because it's here where the truth about man's need for salvation and the truth about the believers standing with God are answered. Many people today who claim Christ as Savior say, well, I don't know if I'm truly saved. I don't know about the, I don't know, I, I've done certain things and I, I just, I'm unsecure about the issues of salvation. Please understand, your protection is not found in your ability, it's found in the righteousness of Christ. And God says to you, if you're lost this morning, there's only one answer to the dilemmas of life and that's for you to believe in Christ. The power then of righteousness is really simple. It's that life-changing effect. It's the beauty to know that for the lost, they can go from righteousnesses that are nothing but filthy, nasty, dirty rags into the beauty and the gloriousness of righteousness found in Christ. I mean, my suit today, I like my suit. I think it's nice. By the way, I have it cleaned periodically, amen? 
because I, I, I never get dirty anyway. I don't know why I do that. Amen? My righteousness makes me look good, right? God said, listen, there's only one thing, there's only one thing that begins to cover you up and makes you look beautiful, and it's the righteousness of Christ. That's the only thing that rectifies the problems. And the power is for the lost man to know that whereas your righteousness is filthy, dirty, nastiness, God says you can have the purity and the beauty and the gloriousness of Jesus Christ. The power is that God can change. Revelation chapter 19, you don't need to turn there. Let me read one verse to you. Revelation 19 and verse 7 and 8 simply says this. This is a, a scene is in heaven, and it's with the church at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Listen to what he says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, that would be to Christ, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's the church, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, let's make a really clear illustration. Ladies, when you walk down the aisle, by the way, my son Dallas and Miss Sarah Stevens are engaged. We're excited about that. I'm sure Brother Larry and Miss Tony, we're excited, a little fearful, a little, little anxious. You know, when your kids get married, all those things. But ladies, there's one thing. When you walk down the aisle... By the way, there's a reason why you wear white down the aisle. There's a reason why you wear white down the aisle. Because God said, your picture is the picture of the church coming down the aisle and meeting Jesus Christ. That picture is displayed in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And your beauty, your beauty is enhanced by the beauty of your garments. And the white and clean matters a lot. The purity of life and the rectitude of the heart. The rectitude and the, the rectifying of the problem. There's only one reason why the church comes down the aisle and meets Jesus Christ in heaven wearing white. It's because of the righteousness of Christ. Please mind yourselves, folks, when, when we get married, encourage your children. Encourage them to understand the beauty and the significance of the marriage ceremony. It matters. It matters. The ceremony matters. Whereas the, the groom represents Christ and the bride represents the church and her journey to meet him has become because of Christ making a difference in our lives. And the beauty of the relationship mirrors the beautiful relationship of Christ and his now clean and white righteous children and saints of God. God said, now you walk down the aisle, there's a reason why you're wearing white. Amen. By the way, did you notice an interesting word there in verse 19, I think it is? No, nope, verse 7. What's it say there? I'm back in Philippians. I think it's verse 8, actually. It says, to her was granted. Did you capture that? To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Please understand you didn't get saved because yourself. It was given to you and granted to you to put on the beauty of Christ. There's an interesting theological doctrine here called imputation. In the theology of God, in the theology of salvation, the, the doctrine of imputation simply means that God, God took His purity and his conformity, his righteousness, and he imputed it or reckoned it into who you are. He gave it to you. And it's only through imputation that God grants it to you that you find any amount of purity. Here's the point. The power of righteousness is found in the truth that anybody coming up short of the glory of God can find the transformation from wickedness and evil into purity and righteousness through the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and let's consider verse 21 and how the Lord talks about this issue of the imputation. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law or outside the law 
is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, here we go now, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Here we go. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. By the way, those verses are just chuck full of good theology and good doctrine. God said, I want you to understand, my righteousness has been declared. God has declared. The idea there is manifest. I've taken my righteousness and put it on display for the entire world to see. And he said, I've declared it and, and manifested my righteousness through Jesus Christ. Look at the Lord. Look at the Lord. There's one thing you'll find out. You don't match up. The first thing you'll know is you don't match up. You've come up short. If I'm comparing me to Christ, there, there's no match. There's no ability for me to understand or to match the righteousness of Christ. But God says, but therein is the beauty. In the declaration of my righteousness, I've offered it to everyone, and I will put it upon everyone who believes. Verse number 21, 22 there is really the doctrine of the imputation. Are you with me this morning? God's given it to the whole world. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. It's unto all, but now it's only upon those who believe. Boy, the moment you believed, I remember, I'll share my testimony several times. When I walked down the aisle at 10 years old, my mom took me aside and began sharing scriptures with me. I don't know exactly when it happened. There was about three or four minutes, five minutes in there from moving from the pew to kneeling at the couch. And my mom showed me some verses, and when I actually prayed, I don't know when it all happened. I really don't care. What I do know is somewhere right in there, God took his beautiful, glorious righteousness, which I saw in Jesus Christ, and he took it and put it upon me. And in that moment, by the way, I didn't feel anything. Amen. I got up off my knees as a 10-year-old boy, and in my heart and in my mind, I knew I was different. Couldn't explain it. Didn't really matter. At the time, I didn't really care. I just knew that I was different based on my faith and belief in the righteousness of Christ. By the way, when you got saved, God took his righteousness and imputed it to you. He reckoned it to your account. It's an old accounting term in the Greek language. God put it on you. Now, by the way, here's one simple truth. The power of righteousness is also seen not just in the change of becoming righteous, but the power of righteousness is also found in the fact it never goes away never goes away I've often thought about you know if I could take my righteousness off and no longer be equated with God you ever had those thoughts you ever had the prodigal son thoughts you know what I'm sick of this I'm gonna go into a far country live like I want give me what's mine I'll never look to you again I'll never talk to you again I'll never return I want to take it all off and go my way and do my thing. I want to do what I want to do. God says, okay, you can try that as best you can. But the fact of the matter is, righteousness is more about blood. And blood is about spiritual DNA. You with me? Because righteousness, as seen as a cloak of righteousness, is also about the remission of sins in the blood. And God said, I'll give you my son's righteousness. The purity of life is found in the blood, not in the behavior. You with me? That's why you go into a far country and live like the devil. But if God has clothed you with his righteousness, it can never be, gone, be taken away. You with me on that? And the Lord declares you are righteous and you are saved. And in the end, you are eternally, eternally secure. Amen. The power of righteousness is incredible. And the issues of God being able to secure us through his righteousness. Let me give you one final thought. Let me try to be very personal. 
and very applicable with you. The third one is simply the application of righteousness. What does it mean then for me as a believer to go through that powerful transformation from lost to saved? Now, being clothed with, a, clothed with the righteousness of Christ, what does that mean? Well, according to Romans chapter 6 then, it begins to change the way I approach life. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 6 says, Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that we might live in Christ. Guess what? There's one truth about your old person. He's dead and gone. He's dead and gone. Do you know that? You see, righteousness translates into the heart, the heart of belief, and it's there in the heart of belief where we believe and know that the old man is gone. The old little handy, the little old, that little 10-year-old boy, make no mistake, I was 10 when I got saved, and I had never done a lot of bad, bad things wrong. You know, the best, worst thing I did was disobey my mom's instructions because that's as far as I dared push the limits. Please understand, though, that little 10-year-old boy, had he been left to himself at 44 now, he would have been a little or big terror in life. Make no mistake about it. So I wasn't a bad sinner. Oh, yes, you were. Oh, yes, you were. Your potential was incredible. And God literally came to you maybe at a young age, clothed you with his righteousness. But that old, evil, nasty, wicked, filthy sinner that you were is dead, crucified, and gone. And now your righteousness is found in Christ. In the end, God says, I need you to know that. I need you to know. And I need you to yield. Romans 6.11 says to, or rather to reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. In other words, God says my righteousness affects how you think? How do you think this morning? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Honest question, are you thinking like the Lord? Are you thinking like the Lord? Righteousness translates into the idea of how we think or how we impute and process information. God said that's the ability of my righteousness to affect you. Romans 3, 11 says, or verse 10, 11 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, and there is none that seeketh. Let me give you one quick application. Listen, if you have any desire whatsoever in your heart to come to God, please understand that's only because of the righteousness of Christ. The ability for God to instill any kind of desire within you because you had no desire when you were lost. You had no zealousness for God whatsoever, but God says, Now, because of my righteousness, I give you desire. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. God says, You need to think the right way. Finally, God said, Here's the application of righteousness. You need to yield yourself. You see, in the battle, in the battle where the breastplate certainly can do its righteousness or its work, in the end, why then do men still fall? If righteousness is not the problem, and if the shield, or rather the, the breastplate rather, of righteousness is secure and strong, then why do believers succumb and fall out of the battle? Why do we see men strewn all over the battlefield of spiritual things seemingly succumb to the battle? Why is that? I can tell you because in the end they yielded to a wrong master. Romans 6 and 13 says, Neither yield your members as servants to unrighteousness, but yield your members as servants unto God, and your members as instruments of righteousness. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There are many believers who have the capability of good, strong battle with spiritual things, but they take their armor off because they yielded to the wrong master. And in the end, they succumb. Battlefields are strewn with believers who claim Christ as Savior. But not, they've not figured out the application of righteousness in their lives. By the way, your surrender to your master is your, your responsibility each and every day. One of the things that I've never been in the military, but the one thing I know about the military, they send you to boot camp so they can brainwash you. They brainwash you. That may be a little harsh terms. They convince you to think different. 
and they convince you to think that whenever your CO gives you a command, you just do it without asking questions.
Oh, that believers would do that. Oh, that we as Christians would just simply obey our master. God said, teach all nations. Let's just go do that. God said, let this mind be in you. Let's just do that. Is that right or no? Be instant in season. Let's just do that. Preach the word. Let's just do that. Pray without ceasing. Let's do that. You know, when it comes to righteousness being active on the battlefield, Satan convinces us in our heart, you don't really need to pray over all those things. You don't need to fight. You don't need to be worried about the souls of the world. Don't worry about that. You don't need to be instant in season. It's okay. Don't be that committed. I mean, nobody's that committed to things of God. Don't worry about all that. Just do what you want to do. He convinces us. And in the end, the righteousness of God almost becomes powerless. And we lose on the battlefield of life. Is that right or no? The application is real simple. Put on, therefore, the whole armor of God. Take unto you the breastplate of righteousness. Take unto you the breastplate. Know that you're saved. And if you're saved, know the strength and power that God gives you to think and to act and to surrender according to the righteousness of Christ in life. Amen? If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I want you to know we, God wants you to be saved. God wants to save you. If you've never been saved, you've never had the righteousness of Christ imputed unto you or given to you, please understand it can happen today. And it can happen through faith and it can happen because of Christ in your life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word. Father, thank you for the armor this morning. Thank you for the breastplate. Father, as it guards and protects, Lord, such vital parts of our life. Father, as it works to fight for us and works to defend us. And Father, may it be the righteousness of Christ that we use on a daily effort, Lord, to exert ourselves on the battlefield to strike blows against the evil kingdom of Satan. Father, I pray that you look into our hearts this morning. Father, give us victory. Give the lost man clarity on their need for salvation. May they be moved this morning, Lord, to be saved. Father, I pray for the believer that we would have the mind of the Lord in everything we do. Father, we love you now. Have your will away during this time of invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name.